Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing your talents and music with us. Thank you to our praise team and to all of our participants and everyone that's been helping out. We sure appreciate it on this January 1st, 2022. Oh, it feels weird to even say it. <laughs> um, I also wanted to mention and, and say another thank you. We've had um, some new equipment just appear out of thin air here in the church. We've got these new uh, music stands. You know, we've only had one music stand in this church when I came here, and uh, we, we, we needed more, and these just appeared. Boy, they just showed up. The Lord sent them like manna out of heaven, and um, we've got new boom stands, and we've got some more um, mic cables that have been purchased, Nassim. Isn't God good? You pray and he provides. Sometimes uh, he provides through George Herber. And that's just a wonderful thing that uh, someone saw a need and participated with the Holy Spirit and helped. So George, thank you for doing those things for us. We really appreciate it. I try to point out when I see people, you know, just having a giving spirit and doing things. It's not to leave anyone out if I miss it, nor to really puff anyone up. Um, but I just, I think having an attitude of gratitude works. So anyways, I wanted to say thank you, George. You're a good man. <laughs> Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we are so blessed to be in your presence. Uh, we just continue to bask in the knowledge and in the awareness of your ever-present uh, support and blessings that are with us, Father. We need you, God. We needed you last year and we need you in 2022 as well. We don't say that flippantly. We say it with sincerity and with conviction, Lord, that this is a new year, new opportunity, new vision. And so, Father, we dedicate our hearts to you, and I just pray that you would speak to us now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Confession time. How many of you stayed up till midnight? And you're not tired at all, are you? You're not sleepy. I'm not going to see anybody's eyes drooping, right? Because I can talk loud if I need to. Keep you awake here. Um, my wife and I really gave up staying up till midnight years ago. It just doesn't really work with our plan and our schedule and just how our lives work. So we, we, we do some activities and things, but we, we often, uh, uh, we drift off before then and, and, uh, don't quite make it, but that that's fine if that's a, a wonderful tradition that you have. Uh, vision is everything. The title of my message today is Vision. I thought that would be appropriate given our process that we've been through. If you've been in this church for a long time, if I've gotten to know you at all or you've been able to be here, you may be tired of me saying it because in different ways throughout the year and a half of I've been here, I've weaved the idea of vision into all kinds of sermons and presentations, board meetings and after church meetings. Uh, we've gone through a visioning process that really started back in the summer of a formal process and then we had additional meetings and prayer time and then we've gone through a survey and we've come to a point where we have some results to share. Um, and it doesn't stop here either, because I'm just letting you know that I believe vision is everything. On some of your uh, uh, papers, I, I didn't get in all of them, but the uh, passage from Proverbs 29, 18 is on it from King James Version, which is the one I think we know the most. Where there is no vision, the people, what does the Bible say? The people perish. So vision is not just a, an anecdote. Vision is not just a bonus to the Christian life. It's not just a, a, a highlight to what the mission of the church is. Oh, it's nice for the church to have vision. Oh, that's fine. Not very important, but if they have it, that's fine. No, no, no. Vision is everything. Where there is no vision, the people perish. This is why God sent visionaries to his people. We call them prophets. We call them seers. They were people that had the ability to help people perceive things outside of themselves. That's what your 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 power of vision is. Now, we can close our eyes and we can see things. I, I understand that there's such a thing as internal vision as well. But, on, you know, from a, a sensory perception uh, a standpoint, vision is the ability to perceive things outside of yourself. And we have 
to have that as an organization, as a people of faith. Because without that, we are stumbling in the darkness. We are without an ability to see what God is doing in our midst and where he is leading us. So vision is everything. There is a reason why, by the way, was anyone in Washington, D.C. in August of 1963? No, generally, yeah. The, I, in almost every church I've been in, when I ask that question, there's at least one person who was there. That is when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I have a dream speech. Okay, it was very hot from everything I've heard. It's sweltering in August of, of 1963. There is a reason why that is generally conceived as the most important speech ever delivered in America. Martin Luther King painted a vision for the country. He was able to to show a perception that people uh, reverberated with and people were able to grasp onto and say, I want that. I see where he's going. That's wonderful. There's a reason why in 1971, when John Lennon, John Lennon released his song, Imagine, that by all general uh, analysis is one of the most popular songs ever written um, uh, in, in modern times. Now, I'm not saying you have to agree with the message of his song, Imagine. It's about world peace, and he says things in there that I don't necessarily agree with. But by most analysis, people say that's one of the most important songs ever written was John Lennon's song, Imagine, because it invites people to imagine, to vision something that is important, something that people uh, 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 agree with, that they see validity in. One more uh, thing from pop culture here. There's a reason why Star Wars is one of the most popular stories and popular movies of all time. And this isn't just Pastor Dave talking. This is just based on analysis because Star Wars, like most movies and stories do, invites you to envision a world in a galaxy far, far away where heroes still exist, where good still conquers evil, and where hope still delivers. Okay, there's a reason why we are attached to these ideas, whether believers or not. There's part something to the human condition that desires vision, that desires hope, that desires a world better than the world we live in. This is this is this is something that is central to scripture as well. God in the very beginning when he calls Abraham out of Mesopotamia, when he calls him out, he gives him a vision of a better world. He says, I want you to go into a new land. You've not seen it before, but I'm promising you it's there and I need you to be there. It's going to be the crossroads of civilization. There I want to establish my kingdom that anyone passing through the ancient world will have to come into contact with the community of faith that holds the values of heaven. I'm giving you a vision. In, in the book of Exodus, when God comes to the Israelites in captivity, he gives them a vision of that promised land. He says, I want you to get back there. I want you to get back to this land of milk and honey. You need to reestablish yourselves. You need to learn through this process. I'm going to give you my sanctuary. I'm going to give you my law. I'm going to create in you a community. He gives them a vision. Throughout the Old Testament, as I mentioned before, God sends visionaries. He sends prophets. He sends leaders. He sends... uh People to guide uh, the, the, the kingdom of Israel to understand what his plan is. He sends them visions. In the New Testament as well, we'll get into a story of how Jesus presents his vision for the New Testament people. But in that context, I do want to invite you to pull out our little survey results. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Again, I know there's a lot of data in here. But I just want to reflect on a couple of things that you as a church um, uh, said in your analysis and your survey and how you scored. And, um, again, we're not going to go line by line through this, Chuck. So be, bear with me. Okay, sir. We'll, we'll find time for that. I want to say the things that I've highlighted and circled are just points of interest to Pastor Dave. They are not to say this is better than other things or this is right or this is wrong. They're just points of interest. On the front page that says five year vision and survey results, the top two that are highlighted those are the, the top scored items within those categories. One is including kids and teens in worship, and the other one is regular outreach options. I want to tell you, this does your pastor's heart good. The top two things that this church says it wants to do, not just in those categories, but on the back page, all the items are listed regardless of category. Those are the top two priorities of this church, according to this uh, vision survey. You as a church said, our top two priorities as a church are to make sure kids and teens are included in worship and to make sure that we are a church invested in outreach. And I just tell you, that's a great thing. 
That is a great position for us to be in. Now, not that any of the other ideas would have been bad. It's not like I would have said, oh, what? You thought that this was the number one thing. Oh, you're, you're foolish people. I would never have said that out loud. I, no, I wouldn't have said that at all. But I just, I really look at these two and I say, God, that is awesome. You, th- we're on the right track. Uh, that is something I'm looking forward to developing and working with you as a church community and, and making sure that we are prioritizing and emphasizing those two things, that we will be a people of outreach and we will be a people that says we want our young people growing and involved and invested in and leading out and growing in worship. And uh, that's wonderful. The only other thing I want to point out on the front page is in the category that says children and youth ministries, okay? And the one that I've highlighted there is the sixth one that says more volunteers. Now, the reason that I thought this was interesting is if you go through the other ideas, they're wonderful. We want to promote Yavapines. We want our kids to go to camp, have children involved in our service, which is similar to including kids and teens in worship, having activity bags for younger kids, kids and drama socials. That's all wonderful, okay? But there's a... There's a disconnect (laughs) in our church because in order to do those things, guess what we need? We need volunteers. So on the one hand, we're saying, oh, we want kids. Oh, we just want to see kids in leadership. We want them worshiping. We want them involved. We want them, you know, spearheading great things like that. But on the other hand, we rated or we, we did not acknowledge to a high enough degree that we are severely lacking in the volunteer support that we need to fulfill that. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm not saying that's bad. And I am willing to estimate that a few of you, when you saw that, thought thought to yourself, that goes without saying. I'm going to put my my numbers in other categories. It's possible. But I think there is a disconnect between the perception that we have as a church and the reality that we're able to deliver. Okay, is that saying it too harsh? Kim, am I okay? Okay. Uh, this is not, by the way, this is not uncommon for churches. We say, oh, we want our kids to thrive. We want to do this. We want to do that. We want to do that. And we, 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 we appreciate what is done, but we often fail to realize how much work it takes to do things for our kids. And we need to be praying about this. We've talked about this. I've preached about it. I've talked with the board about it. We're looking for more resources and more investment as far as people willing to step forward and help in our our Sabbath schools, helping children's church. And and to accomplish this vision, we're going to need more volunteers. So it was interesting to me to see that that did not rise higher in that category because if we want to do those things, it's going to take people, right? So that's okay. I I, I hope that that doesn't... uh, Again, that was just a point of interest to me that within that category, um, the uh, realization that we need more people helping did not rise higher. And I think that's something we need to work on. Okay, on the back page, again, this is just the scores listed, um, uh, regardless of category, just the, the raw scores, highest to lowest. By the way, the dorm scores are there as well, um, but it's in order of the church scores. So the dorm scores, scores are there for reference. A couple of things I wanted to point out. Um, uh, even though this is in what we might call a lower priority, um, toward the bottom here, it says having more potlucks. Do you like potlucks? Yeah, people like potlucks. Not everyone likes potlucks. I understand that. But most people like potlucks. It did not rise to the top among the church members as being something, oh, we want to do that every week. We want to have that more often. But look at what the dorm students said. It was their number one. It was their number one. So even though this is one of those areas where I hope that we as a church can be sensitive to the fact that even though we as a church didn't say, yeah, well, that's number one. We want to have more potlucks. Let's get it going. I think I'd like to see us work on a plan to be a little bit more uh, making that opportunity available to our dorm kids. They obviously value it. And if we want to include teens in worship and we want to build and invest into the life of our young people, isn't potluck a great time to do that? Uh, I think it is. And uh, I think we could be a little more um, focused at our potlucks to not just let the teens, and I'm, by the way, I'm glad they're not here at this moment so I can kind of talk behind their backs and they don't know it. Um, uh, I don't mean it like that, Mark. Don't say it. Don't tell them I said that, okay? Um, but I, I'd love us to be a little more intentional when the dorm kids and teens are here because often they just kind of sit amongst themselves. They eat their food, da 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 and they and then they and then they bolt. Um, it'd be great if, if just a few of us made our way to the table and sat with them and learned their names. Where are you from? Oh, you're from Tucson? Ah, oh, that's great. What do you like about Tucson? You know, and just got to know them, pour into their lives just a little bit. So um, 
that, that, that's just a, a thing I wanted to mention there. Now, the last thing I want to say, uh, well, oh, two more things, two more, and then I'm, again, because I, I am going to preach too. Two more things. Um, I found it very interesting, and I highlighted here again on the back, that um, even though it's, again, low, I just found this interesting, even though it's low in our scoring, um, adding pew racks and, and hymnals to our, uh, to our pews, um, that was an idea that was generated, and we may do that. Again, just because it's a low priority doesn't mean we're not going to do it. It's just we may not do it first. We'll get to it in due course, okay? Hymnals and pew racks. But again, I circled the dorm students' score. Because even though it's not very high, I was amazed how many dorm kids said they miss hymnals. You know, there's sometimes a perception, oh, those kids, they only like the new music. It's got to have beat and it's got to do all that. And, and it's, oh, the old people only like hymns. I was really astounded to see how many teenagers said, I miss having hymns in church. Now, I'm not anti one or pro the other. I'm kind of an eclectic person when it comes to our music. I like everything. Um, and I think there's a place for everything. I just thought that was very interesting. We sometimes misjudge the younger generation. And, and, and think, oh, they just like the, the hipper stuff uh, that's modern coming out on the radio or whatever. But in actuality, it was a fairly high score for our teens to say, um, now maybe they meant the pew racks. They just want some place to put their feet. Maybe maybe that's what it was. So I wasn't able to, to get it all the way down there. All right, the last thing I want to say as far as our analysis here, if you go to the very last item, um, Secret Sisters, Secret Sisters. That was the last thing scored as far as the church scored. Now, in hindsight, I probably, because it was only one gender ministry oriented, it probably skewed the score a little bit because there's probably not a lot of men that said, oh yeah, I'm going to put high scores. We need this, these women doing secret things. That's important. We got to have that happening. You know, I don't think that happened very much. Uh, it probably should have been secret sisters, you know, and or men's ministry or something like that to make it a little more likely to include uh, both genders. So even though it's last on the list, doesn't mean it's not important. It doesn't mean we're going to ignore it. But again, I circled the dorm score on that one because virtually every girl, virtually every girl in the dorm said that they would like to have um, a secret sister ministry. Um, so I just thought that's interesting. These, these young women, um, you know, uh, thought that that would be good, and uh, it's you know a, something that maybe I can share with Catherine and 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 Ashton or, or Campus Ministries. And I, again, if you have a burden about any of these, you might be disappointed and say, "Oh, my number one thing was this, and it's way down in the list." Um, again, when if you have passion for something and you have a willingness to step out and lead, um, we can always uh, try to work with you to make that happen. It doesn't mean that uh, it's going to be a hundred percent sequential, and we're not going to do anything until all the top things are done. It is, uh, it's just a template, just a guideline to give us direction to go as a church and show us what some of our priorities are and to show us what some of our opportunities are. Because without vision, the people perish. So I'm looking forward to working with this vision and working with the church to accomplish wonderful, wonderful things for God's glory in 2022. You know, I was just getting used to writing 21 on the dates. I mean, I was just kind of getting to like, oh, that's normal. And now I got to remind myself 2022. How many of you think a hundred years ago, a little more than a hundred years ago, World War I starts in 1914, Ellen White dies in 1915, U.S. enters the war in 1917. How many of you think that the Seventh-day Adventists alive at that time believed that the earth would last until 2022? <laughs> Were you there? No. <laughs> How many of you think that during the Depression, the Dust Bowl, World War II, that the average Adventist would nod their head and say, yeah, it's bad, but I'm pretty sure we've got another 80 years or so? I don't think very many. How many of you think during the chaos of the Cold War, when kids were going through drills, diving under their desks in case a nuclear bomb. I mean, you think of the silliness of that, but still, you know, the, you know, the chaos, the, the Q, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis and, and all those things. How many Adventists in the, in the heat of that moment would have said, no, no, this will pass, and the Lord will tarry another 50 years or so? I don't think, you know, when, when 9-11 happened in 2001, I think there was a, a heightened uh, moment within the Seventh-day Adventist church where we, we kind of came to a point, oh, it's getting close. 
This is it. There seems to be some real world things happen. Patriot comes and you know, worldwide issues and all that. Live free and all this. Did they really think another 21 years would go by? Do you think this earth will last till 21, 22? Another 100 years? Should that be our focus, though? I want to, uh, I skipped the kids quiz last week, and I, I want to, to have just a moment with our young people. Um, Nassim, would you help me out? You're, you're here available. And um, Vincent, would you maybe help me out on this side? I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot there. I just want to give the kids, again, I mentioned a while back, it's good if the kids speak into the mics. That's way it's picked up in the streaming and the recording, and then everyone can hear a little bit better. And this is a simple, just one question. If you could ask God one question, what would you ask him? This is to the kids. I'll give you some examples. These are real-life examples of what kids have said when asked that question. Why did you make mosquitoes? Ah, that's a good one, isn't it? So don't worry. These don't need to be profound. You know, you can ask if the Seahawks are ever going to win another Super Bowl. That's completely fine. Okay? What... One question, if you could ask God, Geo, I know there's something, Sean, that you would want to mention. Here's another one. How long did it take you to get potty trained? These are real questions. Can you really read my mind? Come on, I need some help. Geo, help us out here. What one question, if you could ask God, what would it be? Do you actually know how many hairs are on our heads? Do you actually know? Yeah, that's good. If you saw that it wasn't good for Adam to be alone, how come you never made yourself a wife? (laughs) Real question that a kid asked. Any of our other young people? I don't mean to put anyone on the spot, even though I do often. Um, I see Anna and Owen and um, Toby, you could help out. Jake. Is Santa your really rich brother? That's another one. Oh, nobody else? It's kind of a kind of a more unique question. Oh, okay, Dr. Herber would like to help us out here. Nassim, would you come to, or, or whoever gets there, that'd be great. Dr. Herber, would you help us out? If you could ask God one question, what would it be? Well, this may not be directly on the spot, but, you know, the Lord preempts all of that by saying, occupy Till I come. Okay. Keep on working. Keep on going. Very good. And do the things that I've asked you to do. Yeah. Very good, sir. Thank you. Toby? What's better, Marvel or Star Wars? Oh, boy. Yeah, I'm sure the Lord is very occupied with that. Here's a couple more. Did you have to practice walking on water or did you just know how to do it the first time? When is your bedtime? I went to a wedding and saw two people kiss in the church. Is that okay? Last one. If Jesus didn't have a sister, why do I need one? Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Oh, we didn't get too many of our young people this time, but it's just a fun thing to think about. If you have your Bibles, yeah, we'll go ahead and you can just set the mic on the pew there. It'd be fine. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to be um, in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And, and we're just going to spend a moment on this because the first day of the year, first Sabbath of 2022, I think it's appropriate in the context of understanding God's vision God's desire for us, I think it's appropriate to look at uh, the passage here in Acts chapter 1. I'm going to go ahead and begin in verse 1, um, and you can follow along with me here in Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Uh, the author Luke writes, The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up into heaven, after he had been led by the Holy Spirit, 
He had given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking to the things to uh, speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Don't miss that. After his resurrection, after he had appeared to them, giving them many convincing proofs, Luke says, it says that he had been speaking to them concerning the kingdom of God. That's what he was talking about. Verse 4, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit for many day, not many days from now. Now, they didn't know it, but the next passage reveals the last question that the disciples got to ask Jesus before he went to heaven. So it's kind of there. What one question would you ask? This is their one question. Now, again, they didn't know it. They thought that Jesus was still going to live amongst them and do, but, but this is the last question that they get to ask Jesus while he's on earth. Okay. Before he ascends to heaven. Verse six. So when they came together, they were asking him saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? One of the, the vices that I have and one of the elements that I just really am drawn to in the life of Christ and in the virtues of God is patience. I don't have, I need better patience. I'm not a patient person. It's, it's one of the things that I need a constant, uh, 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 you know, submission to the Lord. Not that my other things just come naturally. I got to submit to the Lord in all things, but I know that I struggle with being impatient. By the way, what's the uh, King James word for patience? Any of you ever remember, uh, learned the fruits of the Spirit in the King James? Long suffering. Long suffering. You know, when you put it in that term, it, it, it comes to a different, uh, a different mindset to suffer long. That's what patience is. No one wants to suffer long, right? That, that's something we want to get rid of. But patience is long suffering. When the disciples came to Jesus, he'd, res- he'd been through death itself. He'd been resurrected. He'd been walking amongst them doing miracles. He'd done many wonderful. He'd been teaching them. He'd been leading them. Then after his resurrection, it says that here in Luke, he'd been telling them about the kingdom of God. And the disciples said, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. But when do we get our kingdom? And I can, if, if I was the Lord, okay, I, and I lacked patience, I would have been like, where have you been the last three years? Have you learned nothing? I would have lost my patience is my point. Jesus has done everything to teach them and illustrate them that it's not about the kingdom on earth. It had never been about that. And yet after all that he'd been through, after all that he tried to teach them in their infancy, in their naivety, in their flesh, they still come to Christ and they say, yeah, all that's well and good, but what about this kingdom? Is it at this time that we get to have our king again? Is it at this time that we get to rule? Is it at this time that we get to throw off the Romans? And it's like, again, I just think the Lord had to have really had just incredible patience to take a deep breath and reply in a gracious, holy manner. In a way, in a way, the disciples were asking, Lord, when will things get back to normal? Right? That's what they were asking. It's not right. It's not normal that we should be... Sub- we're the people of God. We're the chosen race. Well, it's not normal. It's not your plan. It's not appropriate that we should be oppressed by these pagans. Right? That's not your plan. When will things get back to normal? When we get to be in charge of our own lives. When we get to decide for ourselves what we're going to do. When will things get back to normal? I think the analogy and the... And the meaning there is, is intended. When will we get back to the way we wanted it to be? And what Jesus does, and as has, he, has, he has done throughout scriptural history, uh, throughout the Bible, throughout the New Testament, is he redirects them and gives them a new vision. And this is his answer. It is. Is this is verse seven, Acts chapter one, verse seven? It is not for you to know. That's not the point. 
It is not for you to know the times or epochs, the ages, the eras, which the Father has fixed by His own authority as far as things that are happening here on earth. But here's the point. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses, witnesses of my message, witnesses of my resurrection, witnesses witnesses of my life. You are going to testify. You're going to be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. He shifts their vision and he says, your focus should not be on the kingdom of earth, but on the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. You are going to be my witnesses. That is what your purpose is. That is what your vision is. Things will develop on earth. We realize that. God is deeply concerned with what happens on earth. He, he lays out historical prophecy of, of, of how nations would rise and fall, how, how different elements would, would, uh, uh, would come and persecute the church. The book of Revelation and, and, and the prophecies, we understand that there's going to be different things. But the focus, the vision of the church is not to be so enraptured with the things of earth that we miss out that God has prepared for us a better place. It's very natural, very normal to, to desire to have uh, uh, peace on earth and to have uh, harmony and to have tranquility and to have all the goodness uh, things of God reestablished on earth. And in, in a small way within the community of faith, we do get to experience those things. We get to experience harmony. We get to experience brotherhood and fellowship. And we get to experience joy and, and, and family. We get to reestablish just a little bit of what the Garden of Eden was meant to be within, within our families and within the community. But we do know that God wants us to remember that this earth is not our eternal home. It's not our eternal home. There is a new home that God himself is preparing for us and it is our job, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to welcome and invite and testify and to, to witness so that other people may also become partakers of that heavenly kingdom that God is, uh, is establishing for us. Now there's a balance in all things. You've heard it said before, it's no good to be so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good, Okay. And that's true. It's very cliche. There are people that are just kind of in the clouds all the time, not even noticing what's going around them. So there's a balance in all things. We do need to be concerned about this earth. We need to care deeply about uh, what is happening around us. It's not that we should ignore those things, but we need to understand them in a context that things will not get back to normal on planet earth. If, if things are going to get back to normal, why do we need a savior? Why are we waiting for Jesus to come? Why do we sing about the blessed hope if we think that just one day a new election, a new law, a new thing is going to come and, oh, everything's fine now? (coughs) Excuse me. You never know. Got to be ready. (coughs) Well, the tickle's still there. Sometimes I get excited when I preach, Lisa. Friends, I don't know the specifics of the future. I don't think anyone does. We know that there are markers and there are signs of the times to get us prepared for the things that God is doing. But in 2022, it is my conviction, my my message, my hope, my prayer that we as a church will organize ourselves, organize our individual minds, organize our individual families, and that we as a corporate body would surround ourselves around uh, this goal, this mission, this vision that God has given to his church to make his kingdom the first priority of everything that we do. That every single person that we minister to is invited to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. That every ministry, that every song that's sung, every prayer that's offered, every children's story that's told, every Sabbath school class that meets, every potluck that we eat together and fellowship in is an opportunity for us to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. 
and to remind people as bad as things may get, they may ebb and flow, there might be rises, there might be victories, there might be wonderful things, but ultimately our hope is in Jesus Christ and the kingdom that he is developing for us. And he wants to save us and bring us to that kingdom and reestablish his plan one day more here on planet earth. If we are not about that business, if that is not our vision, if that is not our focus, we are wasting our time. And we are not doing what God has called us to do. This was the message of Jesus Christ before he ascended to heaven. It's just one of those crazy things. You think that they they had no idea that this was about to happen. They thought that Jesus had rose and he was there and he was going to be with them forever and he was going to lead them in in dynamic uh, things on planet earth and then he waves goodbye and says, no, I, I my mission continues in heaven. Plan of the Father continues and I, I have a business that I'm about to go to and it's to your benefit, he says in John 16, he says it's to your benefit that I leave because then the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Comforter will be in your midst and he will fill you with power and you will be enabled to do things you never thought possible. You shall be my witnesses. What are you going to do in 2022? What is going to be your priority? What's going to be your vision? I pray that you would Use these words of Scripture and the words of Jesus Christ to influence and to give you uh, uh, encouragement that you can, and God, by God's grace and through His power and will, you can be a successful witness for Jesus Christ. And maybe, maybe the world won't last another hundred years. But whenever, however long it lasts, when that day comes, as we were encouraged by Dr. Herber, we will be about the Lord's business. And he will find us faithful in that. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much that we can reflect on these passages and we can kind of put ourselves in those moments and think about what all these things mean. Uh, again, Lord, as time marches on, it's natural to wonder and it's nothing wrong with, with wondering too how much longer this earth is going to come and to long for your coming. But Father, um, as we uh, navigate these times, as we think about our role in this world, and uh, the challenges that are before us, the opportunities that are before us, remind us too, Father, and fill us with your spirit that we would be effective witnesses for you in 2022. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here today. Again, grab one of those little uh, paper sacks with some little treats in it on your way out, and we'll see you next week. Looking forward to spending another day of worship with you next Sabbath. God bless.